Secrets of the Southwest takes you to the land of red rock, big sky, and deep canyons. Here, you'll unravel the mysteries of a 1,000-foot maze, jet ski in the middle of the desert, travel barren badlands that teem with unexpected and, at times, deadly forms of life. From westerns to Route 66 to the land the artist George O'Keefe made famous, we've got all the secrets. This is the American West. And in this unparalleled wonder, we'll take you off the beaten path. You'll discover there's nothing like it in the world. Secrets of the Southwest travels to the heart of the Southwest, the Grand Circle. In this corner of the Great American Panorama, the borders of the states of New Mexico, Arizona, Utah, and Colorado blur into one big country. Our first stop, a place you'd recognize even if you've never been west of the Mississippi River. Hey, Curly! Why don't you take the cuffs off the kid? He's mighty handy with a gun. Our images of the Wild West are forever torn from the frames of the Wild Westerns. The cavalry at dawn, cowboys and Indians, gunslingers. Go, Martin, please. A pretty girl, a desperate town, and a hero riding off into the sunset. But what else did many of these movies have in common? They were all shot in a place called Monument Valley. Sculpted out of colossal red rock, this cinematic dream location is engraved in our collective imaginations. What you might not know is that it was a sheer stroke of fate that opened Monument Valley to the world. Beginning with the legendary director John Ford, whose luck changed in the year 1938. At that time, Harry Goulding and his wife were the owners of a remote trading post on the outskirts of Monument Valley. The Gouldings, along with their Navajo neighbors, were struggling to survive the Depression. Visitors to the valley were rare, and there was no market for Navajo wool or crafts. They tried to last it out, and one morning uh, in 1938, Harry heard by the grapevine that there was going to be a movie made on the reservation somewhere out in this area. So uh, he approached his wife, Mike, and said, uh, let's go to Hollywood and see if we can entice John Ford to come to the reservation and make the movie here at, at our property at Goulding's. The couple set out for Hollywood to convince the famous director that this was the ideal setting for his movie. Armed with a stack of photographs and a determination driven by desperation, Harry got his meeting. And the chap that ran the trading post, Harry Goulding, he says, the Navajos are starving. I understand you're going to do a Western. If you come up there and do it, he says, you probably, you'll be doing them a great thing and probably save a lot of lives, and uh, it'll certainly be a great help. Harry Goulding's gamble paid off. Ford made up his mind almost immediately, and production began on a film about a desperate group traveling through Apache country. The film, Stagecoach, went on to earn seven Academy Award nominations and a well-deserved place in movie history. Its success raised the genre of the Western to big budget status and made a star out of a little known actor named John Wayne. As for Monument Valley, it became the symbol of the Wild West and the setting for some of the most popular movies of all time. John Ford returned to Monument Valley many times during his career. He always employed the local Navajos as extras and stuntmen in his films and he revered this land owned by the Navajo Nation. He often said it was the most beautiful and peaceful place on Earth, calling it his lucky spot. And the success of Stagecoach and his other films confirmed it. The Gouldings are gone, but legends never die. Gouldings Hotel is one of only a few places to stay near Monument Valley. The Goulding's home and the original trading post have been turned into a small museum with old photos and movie memorabilia. But the real cinematic star was, and still is, Monument Valley. Monument Valley is not only the backdrop for the movies, it's the backdrop for hundreds of commercials over the years. 
like this one that sold the Chevy Impala in 1964. Although commercials have changed, Monument Valley's rugged setting continues to captivate generations. You can see Monument Valley from the main road, but veer off to the winding stretch of dirt road through Navajo country. You'll discover that Monument Valley is not really a valley, but a flat panorama where time and the forces of nature have turned mesas into towering buttes and buttes into spires. Nearby, there's one place the photographers keep all to themselves, the Valley of the Gods, a land locals call the Miniature Monument Valley. Here, you'll find one of the finest photo ops in the West. And next to the Valley of the Gods, you'll also find a well-kept secret, the perfect place to get away from it all. In fact, the Valley of the Gods Bed and Breakfast is the only home within 360,000 acres. This remote ranch has four rooms for rent, so you better plan ahead. At this bed and breakfast, meals are cooked and served outside on the 75-foot porch with a breathtaking view. Monument Valley was not the only mecca for the movies. Along the Grand Circle, just past the point where the Continental Divide intersects civilization, you'll find the town of Gallup, New Mexico. Gallup's strategic location as a railroad stop amid Indian country made it the choice of a series of directors. And by the 1930s, the town was playing a leading role in the heyday of the Hollywood Western. One place not to miss is El Rancho, the hotel built in 1937 by R. E. Griffith the brother of movie magnet D.W. Griffith. It became a destination to the stars who ventured out to make a record 20 westerns between 1940 and 1965. The facility here, the El Rancho, had all of the amenities that movie stars liked. We had big dances here, big parties here. The whole facility uh, had an aura about it that no one else did. The hotel has been restored to the way it was. Many of the rooms are named for the stars who once slept there. Some even have special amenities, like a kitchenette for Kirk Douglas and the Reagan room that was later upgraded to the presidential suite. Gallup continues to be a strategic stop for travelers exploring the Grand Circle. Several of the original businesses that sprung up to accommodate motorists along Route 66 are still open, including the Eagle Cafe, and Richardson's Trading Post, where you'll find an inventory of 2,600 saddles. And at night, the neon outline of El Rancho invites everybody to drop by. Continuing along Route 66 to the town of Winslow, Arizona, you'll find another secret. The last of the great railroad hotels. La Posada was built in 1930 by the Santa Fe Railroad and Southwest architect Mary Coulter. In keeping with the history of the area, the hotel was designed as a hacienda of a wealthy Spanish don. The facade along Route 66 is actually the back of the hotel. The front faces the tracks to accommodate the public in the days when everyone traveled by rail. This was once a Harvey house, managed by the legendary Fred Harvey Company, who brought top-notch food and service to the Wild West. The Harvey Company provided one of the first employment opportunities for women. Their ads called for young women, 18 to 30 years old, of good character, attractive and intelligent, to move to the West for employment. And as many as 100,000 women did just that. They became Harvey Girls. We served the trains when they came in. People would come in, and uh, I always say it's the first fast food restaurant because we had cards where they could choose what they wanted, and, and then we got it out to them as fast as we could, and they only had about 30 minutes. Will Rogers once said, Harvey kept the West in food and wives. The Harvey girls ventured West to work, but they actually helped settle it. As many as 20,000 Harvey girls married ranchers, miners, merchants, railroad men, and cowboys. 
Today, La Posada has been fully restored as a destination hotel, complete with the 21st century version of Harvey Fine Dining. And the Winslow Harvey Girls Society acts as tour guides of this landmark. It's an excellent way to launch a trip along the Grand Circle. Besides, you never know who will pull up along Route 66. Secrets of the Southwest continues along the Grand Circle, an area that has the highest concentration of national parks, natural wonders, and the grandest canyon of them all. Each year, a steady stream of over four million tourists from around the world come to see the Grand Canyon for themselves, because no picture can do it justice. The majestic canyon, one of the seven natural wonders of the world, covers 1,900 square miles. This is the Great Abyss, and the view from the rim is humbling. At an average of 10 miles wide and one mile deep, this 277 mile long chasm took a mere five to six million years to sculpt. At its base, the Colorado River relentlessly rushes over 160 rapids. When you talk about the Grand Canyon, you have to mention Major John Wesley Powell, one of the first explorers to attempt to unlock its many secrets. Powell's Point honors the one-armed Civil War veteran and professor who led a daring expedition through the uncharted waters of the Colorado River. Not once, but twice, in 1869 and 1871. His mission? To chart and name the canyons and creeks of this land he simply called the Great Unknown. In 1912, Ellsworth and Emery Kolb were the first to record travels down the mighty Colorado River with a motion camera. Their film simulates what braving the rapids might have been like for Major Powell, except that Powell never knew what danger lurked around every bend. The Kolb brothers earned their own place in Grand Canyon history. They became an institution. Their 1912 film had the longest run of any film ever made playing every day for 60 years at the Kolb studio along the South Rim. For those who choose not to take on the river, hike down one of the trails, and you'll soon come to grips with the Grand Canyon's daunting 5,000-foot vertical walls. This is where you can hike to the North Rim, right? You the can if you, if you look where Phantom Ranch is, and then you can see yeah. Yeah, the canyon. Ranger Pam Cox warns hikers never to underestimate the Grand Canyon. We actually call the canyon the giant Venus flytrap because it does, it lures people into it. And a lot of people come here not really understanding what it takes to hike to the bottom. In the summer, the canyon floor is an inferno with temperatures soaring above 100 degrees. And remember, if you manage to make it to the bottom, you have to make it back up. And in their enthusiasm to explore the recesses of the canyon, some visitors ignore warnings and barriers to get close, a little too close for comfort. It's a rare occurrence that somebody's actually going to fall into the canyon. It does, however, happen periodically, and it's usually because people are really just disregarding the fact that uh, this canyon was formed through erosion, that erosion continues, and sometimes those rocks, as they're standing on the very brink of the canyon's edge, will give way, and they'll go with it. Climbing the nearly vertical walls by mule is another way to conquer the canyon. The mule, a cross between a donkey and a horse, has more stamina than a horse. And it really is stubborn as a mule because it refuses to be put in any kind of danger, making the mule ideal to haul human cargo up and down a treacherous terrain. This form of transportation hasn't changed since the days of early travel. Move up over here in front of me. If you're on this mule ride today, I won't see the whites of your eyes. Except today, there are a strict set of rules laid down by tough love mule wrangler, Ron Clayton. These mules are going in that canyon today because you want to go, not because they want to go. They've been there. These mules do not neck rein like a horse. Folks, they single rein like a mule, right to right, left to left. <laughs> Folks, your biggest hurdle today is probably going to be the heat drink your water. I fly about 12 people a year out of that canyon, heat dehydrated, with water hanging on their saddle horn. I need you to put your toe in there. Put this leg toe in there. You ready? Here we go. Grab a hold, climb on up. 
Mules descend Bright Angel Trail, an ancient Havasupai Indian footpath that drops off the rim into a series of switchbacks leading to the canyon floor. And mules are in demand, so plan ahead. These trips are totally booked, up to two years in advance. Going up and down the canyon is taxing, but visitors once had a tough time even getting to the rim. All that changed on September 17, 1901, when the first train rolled in from the town of Williams, Arizona. The Grand Canyon Railway brings this bit of history back to life. Every day, passengers arrive at the Vintage Log Railway Depot, just as they did at the beginning of the 20th century, by steam train. The size, power, and complexity of a steam train demands your attention. This top-of-the-line train cost $27,000 to build in 1923 and a whopping $1.5 million to restore. Ever wonder what it would be like to be in the driver's seat of a 200-ton locomotive engine? All aboard! On a steam train, it's actually the engineer and fireman who are in charge. They constantly monitor gauges to adjust the amount of water, fuel, and steam the train generates, and they regulate complex moving parts. There's a lot more to it than meets the eye. Once the Santa Fe Railroad reached the Grand Canyon, the railroad commissioned construction of a first-class hotel to accommodate travelers. El Tovar, described as the most expensive log house in America, cost a quarter of a million dollars to build in 1905. This national landmark, named in honor of Pedro de Tovar of the Coronado Expedition, is still one of the grandest lodges in America's national parks. To manage El Tovar, the railroad brought in the legendary Fred Harvey Company. But here's something you might not know. In 1902, America's brilliant and most unknown architect, Mary Coulter, began a 40-year association with the Fred Harvey Company and the railroad that changed the face of the Grand Canyon. It all started with the Hopi House in 1905. Hopi House was built as a place for Native Americans to create and sell their art. Coulter modeled it after an old Hopi Indian structure she even brought in Hopi craftsmen to build it from materials picked up on site. As architect and designer, Coulter concentrated on every detail. It's so authentic that according to Canyon legend, Hopi spirits called rock boys are still thought to watch over the house. They're little uh, beings that when you build a building, uh, they come and they watch over the building and I assume from that protect the building from harm and outside influence. But I have to come up some nights and close out the register. And when I do that, sometimes you swear you hear murmuring of voices. We have little sheep that we sell and uh, we have come in and seen the little sheep herded up. And sometimes some of the dolls be in the floor. Uh, and of course, we always blame that. The rock boys did it. Another Coulter building, named Hermit's Rest, recreates the home of a prospector and entrepreneur who lived along the canyon rim for over 20 years. The lookout studio, set in stone, looks like it's part of the canyon walls. And a must-see, one of Coulter's greatest achievements, is the Desert View Watchtower. The 70-foot watchtower sits on the highest viewpoint on the south rim of the Grand Canyon. It's an incredible structure, modeled after Indian ruins. Inside, the ground floor has a shop with a view. The walls of the spiraling stairwell are covered with Hopi symbols. Walk up to the top of the tower, and you'll find panoramic scenery nothing short of spectacular. Mary Coulter was a pioneer of the Southwest aesthetic. Across the West, 11 of her buildings are national landmarks but the Grand Canyon has to be her grandest showplace. On the canyon rim, look down, but also look up. Another secret soars overhead. The condor is America's largest flying land bird with a wingspan of nine and a half feet. 
on the verge of extinction, their population was once down to 22 birds, but a successful captive breeding program allows their release into the wild. In 1996, the Peregrine Fund started releasing birds at the Vermilion Cliffs about 55 miles north, northeast of here. And the birds frequent the South Rim, so we track them. We release them as juveniles, and uh, they're parentless, so we're kind of their foster parents. They're pretty vulnerable in the first few years. Radio transmitters are attached to the bird's wings. Then radio telemetry equipment is used to track the condor. These are like an FM radio that we can directionally, with a three element antenna, swing around and when we're in line of sight of a bird, the signal will come in uh, strong when they're very close and sometimes weak if they're far away or tucked in a canyon somewhere. There's a bird that either has a real strong transmitter or is very close. 52 condors have been released to date. It's hoped that they will breed and reestablish their population in the wild. Cliffs, points, buttes. Perhaps the true way to unlock the secrets of the Grand Canyon is to spend time here. It's been around for a long time, and if you find a special spot and stop to listen, the canyon's many mysteries may be revealed. The end of the day is the sacred hour. The sun sets and the ever-changing panorama dissolves into shadow. Secrets of the Southwest Journey takes us from the 277 mile long Grand Canyon to a 186 mile oasis that looks more like a mirage. Lake Powell, in the middle of the area known as the Grand Circle, is surrounded by 1.25 million acres of open country. Most of the lake's 96 major canyons are accessible only by boat, making it one colossal playground. Here, heaven is a houseboat, one of the best ways to cruise the lake's more remote stretches. You'll also find everything from power boats to jet skiers to RVers along its brilliant blue waters. The explorer Major John Wesley Powell named this canyon Glen Canyon, after the lush glens along the Colorado Riverside. Little did he know that it would one day become the Glen Canyon Dam and Lake Powell, one of the world's largest man-made lakes, would be named in his honor. On October 15, 1956, President Dwight D. Eisenhower pressed a telegraph key from the nation's capital that set off the explosion that changed the Colorado River forever. For all its power, the mighty river that once terrified Powell's men is now turned on and off to meet the ever-changing demands of hydroelectrical power. Our nameplate capacity is 1,288 megawatts, and we estimate that that's enough electricity for about a million and a half people. That's our second purpose here is electricity. The first purpose is storage of water. The massive concrete structure creates water storage for the cities and farms of a thirsty Southwest. This enormous undertaking began with the building of a steel arch bridge over 1,000 feet long and 700 feet above the rushing river to connect the canyon walls. Men called high scalers had the highest risk task, preparing the canyon walls for the dam. Hanging by single suspension ropes, they removed overhangs and loose rocks and installed hundreds of rock bolts by drilling holes 45 to 75 feet deep into the Navajo sandstone. Tunnels were constructed to reroute the Colorado River. It took over three years and 400,000 buckets of concrete weighing 24 tons per bucket to form the concrete blocks. These blocks were used to build the dam's 710-foot walls that are 330 feet thick at its base. 18 people lost their lives building Glen Canyon Dam, America's second tallest after Hoover Dam. Lake Powell began filling up with the closing of the last divergence tunnel. The dam was actually topped out in 1963. We started filling the lake at that point. It took 17 years to get the lake all the way full for the first time. Almost one third of the water was initially absorbed into the sandstone of the canyon. At full pool, the reservoir holds nine trillion gallons of water. 
but no dam is impervious to water. At Glen Canyon Dam, the sandstone's natural fractures allow water to seep through at the rate of 2,600 gallons per minute. That may sound like a flood, but this water is actually rerouted at the dam's base, where it also helps the grass grow. With over 23 million people in seven states depending on Lake Powell, the dam's safety is not left to chance. It's constantly monitored for structural flaws and concrete erosion. And post 9-11, security here is understandably tight. Located at an incredible 3,700 feet above sea level, Lake Powell's extreme size and beauty make it one of the most remarkable man-made places on the planet. You don't have to travel far from Lake Powell to come face to face with the astounding diversity of the Grand Circle. At the Goosenecks National Park, you'll find a true natural wonder. The Goosenecks are formed as the San Juan River steadily makes its way to the Colorado system and eventually Lake Powell. From the top of the Goosenecks, you can see sweeping maze-like patterns. This is the goosenecks of the San Juan River system. It's a classic example of an entrenched meander. It's about 1,000 feet down to the river bottom. What you're seeing is about 300 million years of geologic history right here in southeastern Utah. In this entrenched meander, the San Juan River zigzags six miles while only traveling one mile in distance but it's the consistent texture of the rocky terraces that is so mesmerizing. Standing here, you can almost sense the steadfast advance of time and the river. The Grand Circle takes us through Indian country. The Navajo Reservation, the largest reservation in the United States, covers 25,000 square miles of this region. Canyon de Chez, south of the Goosenecks, is the center of the Navajo Nation. The mouth of their magnificent canyon is only 30 feet deep, but it plunges to 1,000 feet within 15 miles. Awesome archaeological sites like White House Ruin reveal that the canyon has been a home to people for over 4,000 years. For the Navajo, the secrets of this canyon go beyond physical beauty into the spiritual realm. Spider Rock, an 800-foot sandstone spire, is the sacred home to Spider Woman, the deity who taught the Navajo women to weave. And weaving has been a way of life. The Navajos produce some of the finest rugs in the Southwest. You need to turn off the beaten path to explore villages like Shanto, hidden deep in Indian country. Here, you'll get an insider's view of Navajo life. You'll also find arts and crafts for sale in the room next to the general store. At Shanto, you can tour a one-room, earth-covered hogan, a traditional Navajo home. The doorway of a Navajo hogan always points toward the east because you, they want your doorway or your pathway to greet the sun. The sun is very important to our culture. Every hour and minute the sun's coming up, there's different levels of rays that, that help you. The ceiling of this hogan is woven like a work of art. Today, hogans are primarily used for ceremonies and healings. Another turn off the beaten path takes you to the Hubble Trading Post in Ganado, Arizona. This national landmark, opened in the 1870s, is the oldest continually operated trading post on the Navajo Reservation. The original trader, John Lorenzo Hubble, depended on the Navajo for horses and their main trade item, the Ganado rug. Hubble's current trader, Bill Malone, says that back then, the trader was one of the most important outsiders in the community. He did all their uh, translating. He, he got a hold of people that were far away from, from home. He helped them in their burials. He did things like that. He helped them in their credit situations and other things. He was the banker, the postman, and the grocery store man. Hubble's was operated by the Hubble family until the post was sold to the National Park Service in 1967. Over a century later, it's still the place to get the best Indian-made crafts and brush up against the past. 
Secrets of the Southwest travels to the southern border of the Grand Circle, where we find the Painted Desert. Here, the story of the Earth is revealed in barren badlands. This crescent-shaped 150-mile apocalyptic arc across Arizona includes the over 93,000-acre Petrified Forest National Park. Shades of red, white, gray, and orange form the muted palette that gives the Painted Desert its name. These largely inaccessible areas can be bleak. You can see the badlands behind me. Those were once the remains of a wetland. This whole place was a floodplain. And the trees were log jammed down here, flowing down from highlands nearby. And they were buried. The silica from nearby volcanic ash caused the trees to turn to stone instead of rotting. Petrified wood is actually a fossil. The petrified forest contains one of the world's largest concentrations of petrified wood, and wind, rain, and time continue to expose more of this land of fallen logs. The stone trunks lie in segments, fractured by earthquakes, pressure shifts, and dramatic temperature changes. The largest log, nicknamed Old Faithful, measures nine feet in diameter. Although the petrified wood is protected by law, some people just can't resist the temptation to pick it up. We're losing up to 12 tons a year. It's mostly people who just want a little piece of the area, a souvenir. Once they get home, they feel guilty. We get these incredible letters we call conscience letters, and they explain how their wife left them or their dog died, and they'll actually send this stuff back to us. We have piles of this stuff, tons of material over the years. These petrified pieces are like parts of a puzzle. Once removed, the park has no idea where they belong, so the pile of returned stolen wood continues to grow. Nearby, we also find evidence of more recent volcanic activity, some 3,000 years ago. At the El Mel Pais, eight volcanic events and five lava flows help create this 114,000 acre lava field, the largest in New Mexico. Only a few routes, including an ancient Pueblo Indian pathway, cross the extreme backcountry. Here's something you should know. At the El Mel Pais, it's easy to get off the path. And in the monotonous landscape, that's enough to make your heart pound. Losing your direction is not the only danger. You also need to watch your step. Hidden beneath the jagged surface, lava caves and crevices can be several meters deep. The contrast of the rocky lava beds next to some of the most striking sandstone cliffs in the southwest draws people to these extraordinary badlands. There is nothing that even remotely gets your attention to explore this next secret. You just have to know it's there. Rock Art Ranch seems like the middle of nowhere, but it's only seven miles outside Winslow, Arizona. Here, the earth flattens into grasslands that continue all the way to the horizon, except for one unexpected gash. You go down a narrow passageway for the payoff. Rock art panels that few modern people have ever seen line both walls of this hidden canyon on private property. Rock art ranch owner Brantley Baird knows he has one of the finest strands of petroglyphs in the world. Now, uh, the archaeologists uh, claim that some of the petroglyphs in the canyon are 7,000 years old, and, and this is what they call the desert varnish, the patina, the black, has completely resurfaced over the, like this is a deer here, and then there's another deer right here, and there's a person here. Uh, you can see the newer stuff, looks like families up here holding hands and dancing, and here's some dots and there's a person there. Now that stuff there is a lot newer. The pristine waters of this canyon flow all the way to the Colorado River. It's so idyllic that you have to wonder why the ancient ones ever left. Drought, disease, dwindling food, or overpopulation are all possibilities. As for the meaning of the rock art, you can make out images of birth, the sun, a herd of deer. But part of the fascination is that we'll never know the real truth. These relics from the past remain as much a mystery as the ancients that left them behind. 
you never know what you'll find in the Southwest. While you'd expect to see horses at home on the range, the llama has now staked its claim. Imported from South America, llamas are relatively new. Did you ever wonder what it takes to take a llama out in the desert? The answer, not much. This pack animal is made for the backcountry. Native to high altitudes, this camel without the hump can store water. It's an efficient browser. The llama can live off the land, but unlike a horse or mule, llamas don't grab the grass and obliterate it at its roots. Their soft padded hooves maneuver well on slick rock and minimize the impact on trails. Larry Sanford of the Buckhorn Llama Company claims llamas have one pretty interesting quirk. Bears run away from them. I never would have imagined that, but uh, they do in fact have an alarm cry that you're probably, we're probably not gonna hear today. And it's not an alarm for the llamas. The sound is to chase off what's coming in. And it's much louder than this, but it's sort of like an asthmatic elk. It's kind of a kind of thing. It's really strange. As for riding llama back, forget it. Llamas are limited in the weight they can carry, so they're used for loads, not people. Deserts and badlands can be inhospitable hosts to humans, but they're not exactly barren. Sometimes you just have to take a closer look to find forms of life. And out west, small does not mean less significant. Spiders, scorpions, snakes, and lizards are all inhabitants. Although they do their best to avoid us, you might see them crawling about. The warm, dry climate makes a perfect home for 1,000 species of spider, but the black widow is the most notorious of them all. As they say, you'll know one when you see one. Black widows here are jet black with a red hourglass-shaped belly. They're venomous, though not fatal to humans. But the male of this species has to worry. The female eats him after mating. And this female Texas blonde tarantula likes to stay close to her burrow. You might find the males wandering on the road after a rain, probably looking for a mate. 40 species of scorpion can be found in the southwest. Hunting at night, they grab prey with their pinchers. Scorpions eat almost anything, including another scorpion. And if looks could kill, this vinegaroon or whip scorpion would be fatal. But it is actually harmless. Its only defense is a whip tail and vinegar odor. But don't mess with the Gila monster. It snaps in a flash, and its razor-sharp jaws hold on. The venom glands in the lower jaw transmit a fast-acting poison that flows into the wound as the Gila monster digests its prey. One of only two types of poisonous lizards, the Gila monster is not lethal to humans, but one good bite could send you to the emergency room. Over 70 species of snakes in the Southwest make you want to look before you leap. More snake bites are recorded in the Southwest than anywhere else in North America. The largest species of rattlesnake, the Western Diamondback, is the snake most associated with the Wild West. It's also the snake responsible for the majority of snake bites. Bob Myers, curator of the International Rattlesnake Museum in Albuquerque, New Mexico, says that when it comes to rattlesnakes, there's a lot of myths. It is not a mean or aggressive snake like, like a lot of people would describe it. It is very defensive. It will sit still if you come a, a, upon it. And uh, you can literally walk circles around the snake and that snake will follow you with its eyes until it feels comfortable and not threatened. It will sit still and, and stay in that defensive posture. Another myth is that you can tell the age of a rattler by counting its rattles. Actually, new segments grow up to four times a year and old segments get brittle and break off. So, short of a birth record, there's no way to tell their true age. The third big misconception uh, is, is mistaken identity. A lot of people will see other snakes and think they're looking at rattlesnakes, where they're actually looking at a, a non-venomous snake that's uh, not going to do any harm. It uh, breaks my heart to hear about any snake being killed, but 
when people are killing non-venomous snakes thinking they're killing a venomous snake and doing the world some good, they're way off base. They're killing a, a great rodent hunter and a friend. One friend is getting set free today. This one was picked up in someone's backyard. Uh, it was found in their yard. They were afraid of the snake. So it was brought down to the Rattlesnake Museum. We're going to release it today. Uh, the Coach Whip Snake is a very fast moving snake, one of the fastest in North America. So I'm going to set it out in this uh, clear area so we can take a look before he takes off. Once he gets down into the grass or, or small rocks, uh, we won't see him uh, for more than a second or two. But I'll go ahead and release him right down here. He's a non-venomous snake. There he is. There he goes. He's gotten down into the grass now. He's safe. He feels secure. He'll uh, live a, a nice long life out here. Let's see that again in slow motion. The Coach Whip, one of the fastest snakes in North America. At the International Rattlesnake Museum, you'll find over 34 types of rattlesnakes and other indigenous critters of the Southwest. And here, you can appreciate them all from a safe distance. Exploring the varied and dramatic landscape along the Grand Circle tells only part of the story. Secrets of the Southwest takes us to the land of enchantment, New Mexico, a land framed by some of the most majestic mountain ranges in the entire Southwest. Here, the land of enchantment refers as much to the rich and laid back culture as the magical setting. The jewel of the Southwest has to be the city of Santa Fe. It's also the nation's highest capital, located at 7,000 feet above sea level. In this once isolated community, you'll find the three Southwest cultures, the Anglo, Spanish, and Native Americans living side by side, sharing a passion for personal freedom and art. This combination creates a vibrant scene and the third largest art market in the United States. All around town, you'll find an eclectic mix, often displayed in settings that are works of art in their own right. A continuous stream of artists has been drawn to this corner of the world. There's something deeply moving about these highlands and high desert. Well, O'Keefe fell in love with the area around Ghost Ranch, and that house suited her perfectly because it was isolated. It gives her an incredible view. She saw the Pedernal from her patio, and she often would say that God told her if she painted it enough, he'd give it to her. The red cliffs behind the house, the purples, the reds, the greens, the oranges, these were colors that she found fascinating and the landscape configuration she found fascinating.